on today's World Insight with Tian Wei. China and the U.S. to resume trade talks with some Chinese imports up for U.S. tariff exemption. And a young female Chinese writer ends up a science fiction trailblazer up close with sci-fi author Hao Jinfang. We, we just try to express that uh, actually technology uh, is coming to our life. Here's our host, Tian Wei. Hello and welcome to World Insight, coming to you live from Beijing. We begin with the latest on China-U.S. trade war. The Chinese Commerce Ministry confirms trade talks with the U.S. will resume across the Pacific. The Trump administration said it would exempt 110 Chinese products from hefty tariffs after American companies complained the duties harmed their bottom lines. Take a look. The world's two biggest economies will resume trade talks after a two-month hiatus. On Tuesday, 110 Chinese products were out for tariff exemption, ranging from medical equipment to key capacitors, seen as an icebreaker since trade tension started. The Chinese Commerce Ministry said the chief negotiators of both sides talked by phone on Tuesday. Trade teams from the two sides will restart consultations on the basis of equality and mutual respect. China's stance on trade talks is consistent and clear. U.S. pressure on Chinese telecom giant Huawei also eased a little. On Tuesday, Treasury Secretary Steven Mnuchin has encouraged U.S. suppliers to seek governmental approval to resume selling equipment to Huawei. The telecom powerhouse has been caught in the middle of a prolonged trade spat after the U.S. added Huawei to a trade blacklist in May. A thaw in trade relations followed the meeting of the top leaders of both countries on the sidelines of the G20 summit last month. Mr. Trump agreed to hold off more tariffs on Chinese goods. Uh, we agreed that I would not be putting tariffs on the $325 billion, and we sell to Huawei a tremendous amount of a product that goes into the various things that they make, and I said that that's okay, that we will keep selling that product. Trade issues do remain. Some of the sticking points include U.S. demands for China to buy more American farm products and Washington's controversial approval of a multi-billion dollar arms sale to Taiwan. Larry Kudlow, the White House National Economic Council director, said the U.S. was looking for quality, not speed, in trade talks. China has kept an open door to negotiations, but ruled out giving in to all of Washington's demands. China's core concerns must be well solved. We will definitely find solutions through equal dialogue and taking care of each other's reasonable concerns. China has emphasized the best deal is one made out of mutual respect and goodwill. For more on China-U.S. trade talks, we have in Washington Jeff Moon, an international trade and government affairs consultant who is also the former assistant U.S. trade rep for China. And also in Hong Kong, we have Ever Xie, chairman and CEO of Gaofeng Advisory Company. Last but certainly not least, in our Beijing studio, Xu Sitao, the chief economist of Deloitte, China. Welcome, gentlemen, to our program. First of all, I hope you are going to have a great weekend. But the issue of trade is still with us. So I'll go to you first, uh, Mr. Moon. Tell us more about the U.S. reaction so far about the Huawei's call today to ask the U.S. to take it off from the so-called entity list of the Commerce Department. Mr. Moon. Well, there have been statements already by the administration that that's not going to happen. Mm. Just a couple hours ago here in Washington, Peter Navarro, one of President Trump's senior advisors, said that Huawei will remain on the entities list. Um, to the extent that there will be sales of technology to Huawei, that will come in the form of licensing exceptions. And that's what uh, the report about Secretary Mnuchin encouraging companies. If that's true, that would be encouragement for companies to file for exceptions for certain technology purchases to be able to happen. I see. Mr. Mo, according to your uh, practical and certainly professional knowledge, 
How long it would take this process for companies to file, first of all, for application, then get permission, and eventually be able to resume interaction with Huawei? What does it mean for American companies who are now looking for solutions, Mr. Moon? Well, I think that um, I'm not sure about the exact timelines. Yes. Um, they can take a little bit of time. But I, the Huawei question is a very large question, and it involves three different dimensions. There's a national security dimension, of course, there's a trade dimension, and there's a law enforcement dimension mm. that we haven't talked about yet. The national security dimension here is for the U.S. to precisely define what is the national security risk in terms of sales of technology to Huawei. Yes. The trade dimension involves applying narrowly tailored measures to address those security risks. And there's also a reciprocity issue here in terms of why Huawei should be able to do this kind of business, but American tech firms can't do this kind of business in China. And the last issue, law enforcement addresses uh, prosecuting alleged violations, in this case bank fraud, perhaps by the chief financial officer. All right. so in order to resolve the Huawei issue writ large, we need to, to address all of these dimensions. Obviously, from the U.S. perspective, it seems to be a very complicated process, and certainly there are different layers as they see as important. However, the Chinese side does not see it that way. Mr. Xu, you are not representing at all the Chinese government. But from your knowledge of what the Chinese businesses are thinking, because you've been interacting with them on a very frequent basis, and also the eventual issue about uh, geopolitics, how is it reflected upon a crossfire on Huawei, what do you think is the concern or are the concerns from the Chinese side? Uh, the concern is um Probably um, the argument of national security, security yeah. cannot be um, overused. Um, uh, for argument's sake, if this is indeed uh, an issue of um, um, national security, then it can no longer be used as a bargaining chip for trade uh, negotiations. So mm. there is a contradiction. So that is why I think for both countries, when they are dealing with this, um, they cannot mix this two. Mm. Meanwhile, if there were any violation, quote unquote, uh, regarding national security or threat of national security, the USI still need to specify it before it claimed the Huawei was a concern of the national security, isn't it, Mr. Xu? Just to clarify. Yeah, that's indeed the case. Okay, so let me move on also to Mr. Xie uh, about that. Uh, Huawei is only one of those cases uh, between China and the United States. A company specific one caught in the geopolitical uh, crossfire. Do you see that as a symbol whether U.S. China trade issue will continue or it should be? dealt with very separately, Mr. Xie? Uh, in, unfortunately, uh, the, the two sides of the issues are somewhat intermixed now. Uh, the trade issues are now intermixed with the relationship between businesses. Uh, from what I, uh, what I do, uh, my work with my men or my American clients, uh, many of the American clients are actually very frustrated uh, by the uncertainty and also the instability that they see because they have invested a lot uh, into China. They would like to do business with China, yet at the same time, the lack of resolution uh, from the trade uh, dispute standpoint have really caused them a lot of uh, sort of uh, uh, problems right now. And therefore, uh, as you know, uh, there has been quite a bit of reactions from the U.S. businesses uh, on, the, on uh, trying to uh, sort of lobby or inform mm. the Congress as well as the administration that uh, you know you better come to some degree of resolution fast. Mm. Interesting. Mr. Moon, therefore I go to you. We all understand that this is going to be a very political year for Washington with the election coming up. Meanwhile, the current White House is not necessarily in its best time, shall we say, with many things related to it still going on and boiling. So what would that mean, uh, this timing, for the U.S. to come to certain kinds of a cool consensus regarding its nature of relation with China 
and therefore, of course, its nature of relation in terms of trade and economic ties with China. Mr. Moon. Well, your question touches upon a very important change in the negotiations that are going on right now. Up until May, when we had a break in the negotiations, really the talks were economically focused and, pr and prob in a problem-solving kind of way. We've now moved in, since negotiations have resumed, into a political season. In the United States, obviously, the presidential election now has started. And in China as well, in June there were some sensitive anniversaries and there are other sensitive anniversaries coming up in October and, and other high leadership meetings so that politics is coming into play much more than before. And when politics is the dominating factor, um, nationalism plays very well, quite frankly. And that does not bode well for the trade negotiations because it reduces flexibility <laughs> when leaders are afraid to make the concessions necessary mm. to get to a common understanding. Mr. Xi, when it comes to the real discussion of the trade talks, obviously you heard already from China's Commerce Department talking about the resumption of talks, and also you heard uh, from uh, Mr. Liu He's uh, phone call with uh, the two uh, secretaries from the United States Trade Rep and also Secretary of uh, Finance uh, earlier Tuesday. Uh, what do you consider as some of the pragmatic opening for the talks? Uh, what are some of the topics, once the two sides touch upon, could be regarded as constructive basis to continue the conversation? Mr. Xie. Yeah, I think so far what we have seen is that the, on the Chinese side, the Chinese side had made uh, proactive uh, efforts to try to re-initiate re the talk with the American uh, team. Uh, I think the, the Chinese has made very clear that the discussion needs to be proceeded on the basis of mutual trust and open discussion, and that uh, hopefully you know both sides will treat each other with uh, mutual respect. Mm. And I think this will be a set of preconditions that the uh, Chinese would like to see the Americans uh, be forthcoming uh, also as a counter-offer uh, to resume this talk. Mm. On the other hand though, uh, Mr. Xu, there are always two sides at least of a mm. coin. Mm. <coughs> when the U.S. is going into its presidential election season, it is also the time when politicians are in a hurry to guarantee their voters mm. that they have been doing something. Now. We, it is also a time that they want to say this is their legacy mm. of one kind or another. So what does that mean? Is there a window opportunity for Washington and Beijing <coughs> to be able to figure something out and therefore to present to both sides? Um, you're absolutely right. From U.S. side, um, election campaign already well underway. Even though economy right now is strong, but in six months, a year, we may see a pronounced slowdown of the U.S. economy. Mm. So that's giving incentive pr for President Trump to strike a deal with China mm. on trade. In addition to that, when you look at a tariff rate of 25% and so on and so forth, mm -hmm. clearly it's just not realistic because if you really impose 25% on certain companies, that really means those exporters, they need to give up the U.S. market you know, really permanently. Mm. And in reality, what we have seen in the past six months, um, that's indeed not the case because uh, people try to find ways to deal with the tariff. And in fact, in the past few days, and the news flow suggesting on the U.S. side, companies are allowed to apply yes. this list, the exclusion list, not, not to be uh, subject to the tariff. So, all in all, I think uh, both sides mm. will have incentive to strike a deal within this year. What about that window opportunity to you, Mr. Moon, particularly from the business perspective? I think there is an incentive for both sides to come to an agreement. I really hope that they do. I question really whether there is the political will mm. for that to happen. Uh, on the U.S. side, as we go into the election, if President Trump can reach an agreement that fully addresses American priorities, purchases, market openings, industrial policy, enforcement, that truly addresses those, then that would be an achievement that would be helpful with the voters. However, during the election, whatever deal he reaches 
will be scrutinized carefully and criticized heavily. And if the deal is not defensible, it's not worth reaching. And the Chinese posture right now suggests that we may not be able to get to that kind of an agreement, mm. at least in the short term. I hope I'm wrong about that, but I'm really not that optimistic about it. On the economic side, I agree that there are clouds on the horizon, but uh, the stock market yesterday reached all-time highs. Unemployment in the U.S. is at a low, a 50-year low, mm. um, so there may be softening coming, but um, if Trump was ever going to have this kind of a trade war, um, I hate to say it, but this might be the time for him to do it. Mm. Of course, it is the strategy for negotiation, Mr. Xi, that one side would bolster the stance, uh, describing the picture as uh, beautiful as possible, suggesting there's no hurry to reach a deal. It's always uh, one of those negotiation skills. But, uh, Mr. Xi, how much do you see a window opportunity? Uh, meanwhile, what Mr. Moon said is very interesting as to what he considered as the Chinese approach might be step by step, not in a hurry either because China wants to reach a deal that what it considers as fair and sustainable. So, uh, Mr. Xi, what do you think about the earlier questions and comments? Um, with respect to the Chinese government's stance, my, my sense is that the Chinese government have laid out the principles for negotiations very clearly, mm -hmm. which I just mentioned already uh, yes. a few minutes ago. Uh, I think the speed issue is in a way irrelevant, in, uh, not that relevant as long as the princi principle is going to be adhered. Um, so that's the, my, my answer to your question on the Chinese government's stance. Uh, with respect to the U.S. side, uh, this is my own read is that in addition to the uh, election issue, uh, the, the U.S. team actually, the U.S. administration actually also consists of uh, different consistencies. Mm. There are people who are more on the hawkish side uh, and therefore they would like to be tougher on China or for the matter any other sort of quote-unquote enemies that they see. Uh, yet at the same time, there are people who would like to uh, you know, come to ref resolution quickly. Uh, I at least uh, to my knowledge, there are plenty of uh, businesses in the U.S. who would really want to continue to do business with, uh, with China simply because China is such a huge market, in particular actually for the suppliers on the electronics mm. uh, to the uh, manufacturer of consumer electronics in China. As you know, for a long time, that's a symbiotic relationship. The U.S. have technology on certain critical components. They ship to China. China design and manufacturing them and showing them back to the U.S. That has always been uh, a very, uh, uh, in a way, uh, uh, beneficial, mutually beneficial relationship. Right. But uh, with the artificial chop uh, by the uh, so-called uh, trade uh, measures, uh, this uh, has been chopped up. And many of the American suppliers are actually feeling a lot of pain in this process. Yes. So I think to your question about the timing from the U.S. side, I, I believe that there's also a lot of pressure from different f certain factions mm. within the U.S. community that is now fo trying to force this issue to go through in a reasonable speed. I see. Mr. Xu, when we are asking the question about whether Washington is having a consensus as to what is the nature of relations mm. in the future between China and the United States, one could also ask that question toward China mm. about what does it mean, this apparent trade war, for Chinese thinking and consensus about research with the United States. Now, when you have, whether it's sanctions or tariffs and mm. Huawei caught in mm. geographical, geopolitical crossfire, mm. and you have companies that are having a difficult time, international mm. ones, providing Chinese companies, tech companies, with components. What does it mean for the argument in China to establish as much as possible its own mm. chain sure. of supplies, every part sure. of it? Sure. I mean, clearly, um, there is a school of thought. And in China, you need to be self-reliant, not just in technology, and even, for example, energy. Um, is this strengthened by the current situation between uh, China and the United States? Uh, complicated. Mm. That's one school of thought. I see. The other school of thought is um, the trade war. It's a bit like a stress test.
for financial institutions. Mm. So that's the necessary external pressure for China actually to even open up the market. And once China's vast domestic market opened up, then of course business community at large and will lobby on China's behalf. Mm. I still think second uh, um, school of thought is dominant at yeah. this point. Just to follow up about that, mm. it makes sense, right, mm. what you have just said. However, with uncertainties, yeah. as a result of this ongoing trade war, because you never know when it would end sure. and with what result, <laughs> okay, at okay. what speed, <laughs> and how the implementation well, okay, can be done. Okay, sure, sure. And therefore, what does it mean, really, yeah. for businesses and well, for this thinking? I, I think for business, I think people are realistic. In the end, yes. I don't think we go back to uh, April-May period. Um, even the deal we are discussing, it's not a grand bargain. Mm. It's a, maybe it's a temporary agreement. So at least we don't see additional hype on tariffs. And at least we see some ease of restrictions for Chinese uh, companies to invest in the U.S. Mm. Not just that, and also culture exchange, so on and so forth. And of course, some of the sticky point being uh, alluded by, by U.S. colleague, yeah. I, I think they will be addressed, but in the medium term. Mm. Uh, Mr. Moon, so here's the thing. It seems that a lot has been said by the three of you gentlemen, but there has to be something for the near term to give people hope, at least for businesses from both sides and the global economy. And then also some of the other complicated issues be handled step by step. Do you think that would be a logic accepted by both sides for the near future, Mr. Moon. Well, I think we've learned some important things from the trade war so far. Um, one is that neither side is self-reliant, um, that we are dependent upon each other. Um, China on technology, say, with regard to chips, the U.S. with regard to rare earth metals. There are lots of other examples as well. That means that there can be no decoupling as some people in Washington like to talk about. Decoupling is impossible. We need to find a way to work things out. And in order to work things out, we need to reach some kind of an agreement um, with regard to these trade issues. Mm. I don't know that it's going to happen in the short term. Uh, Mr. Xu talked about a sort of a small agreement on certain issues without getting to the comprehensive issues. I'm not sure in this political season that Trump could reach a small agreement and go to voters and say that's all he got for all of the stress that we've had over but the past But it also year. has a lot to do and with how is he going longer. to portray it, right? Yeah, yeah. No matter Head, what you reach, reach. Yeah. Uh, it's going to be important as to how you describe it for yeah. whoever side and by whoever. <laughs> so that's always one of the things that we have to bear in mind as well. And one big deal in one side might be a small deal in yeah. the other side. Well, a not make much difference deal in one eye could be a huge difference deal in the other side. So it really depends also on the sectors that we're talking about as well. And Mr. Xie, what do you think, a short term, middle term? Is that the logic as you see it? Yeah, I think um, to come up with a uh, comprehensive deal that uh, all sides and all factions, by the way, within the U.S., all for the matter in the China, are all happy about you know the the, the whole deal mm -hmm. in the near term is probably going to be uh, quite difficult simply because of the uh, different interests I see. within the different sides. Mm. How, however, I I think that coming up with some pragmatic measures in the short term, even uh, the measures that we were talking about, you know, some exceptional lists all right. for certain exceptions for certain things or certain companies that they, could do get it, they can do certain things in the meantime is going to create some degree of certainty okay. or certain degree of businesses. I think this is probably going to happen All right, in the short term. We have very limited time. Of course, it's only 110 companies that get so-called exemption and it takes a long process of application. <laughs> this is only a c job in the sea. Uh, Mr. Xu, final words from you. Short term, mid term? Short term, at least I would call that ceasefire or how you define that and some Americans saying this is like a baseball game, maybe when the second inning, third inning, in the medium term, and some of these issues will be addressed. And also to China's 
best interest, for example, reforming state-owned sector. I see. Xu Sitao, Edward Xie, Jeff Moon, thank you so much. If it's a baseball rule, I probably have to go back and check it, <laughs> how it works. Hmm. Thank you so much for the three of you. Have a great weekend, gentlemen. And you're watching World Inside with me, Tianwei, still to come on our live program. A young female Chinese writer ends up a science fiction trailblazer, up close with sci-fi author Hao Jingfang right after this break. Welcome back. You're still watching World Inside. I'm Tian Wei. The program coming to you live from Beijing. Science fiction is not only about stretching our imagination, but also often a tale of triumph of the human spirit. Literally and figuratively, science fiction has a unique appeal in China, as people often say that art imitates life, massive social changes, and technological advances in recent years are a rich material for writers. One of them is Hao Jingfang, the author of the science fiction novelette Folding Beijing, and the first Chinese woman to win a Hugo Award for Best Novel in 2016. Earlier, I sat down with her on the sidelines of this year's summer doubles in Dalian, where innovations and the age of fourth industrial revolution are major topics. The young science fiction writer shared her thoughts about the relationship between science and technological advancement and the current realities of humans. Take a look. One of the issues people have been talking about is exactly what is the nature of relations between technology and human being. I know, Jingfang, you've been working on a series of dramas based on which there are discussions about exactly that topic. Tell me more about that. Yeah, we are now uh, fostering a new project called the, F uh, the Dust of Future the dust of future. We, we just try to express that uh, actually technology uh, is coming to our life like dust. Uh, you, you cannot sense uh, all the details of it, but uh, finally you find that, that your life is just covered with all those tech, new technology. And also we, we would like to explore what is the um, impact of all these technology on the normal life of uh, so, uh, human beings. Mm -hmm. So it, we call it uh, uh, the dust of future. In this series, so we developed all different kinds of new technologies. Each episode will represent one uh, new technology. I understand there's one specific uh, talking about social media yeah, we and how people use social media or be dominated by social media. Yeah, we call it the super social media. <laughs> Nowadays, because uh, you know our, uh, because using the big data system and we receive our news uh, uh, pushing by the big data system. So what if that system um, extend into our real life social uh, Interaction. yeah, interactions with the others? What if you walk into the street and your uh, AI assistant tells, tells you who you should talk to and the, he, t he might tell you this person's uh, background, this person's information and tells you how to interact with this person and then the, uh, uh, you, you, the assistant, the AI assistant will be your master to tell you who you should uh, interact with and this AI assistant m might or even choose the uh, girlfriend, the boyfriend for <laughs> you and uh, he, uh, the assistant uh, will dominate your social, real social life. Of course that could be a shortcut which is much easier for human beings yeah. so we don't have to think too much, we just follow whatever the AI system is trying to help yeah. us with. But at the end of the day, what if we didn't have it anymore? Oh yeah, if you just, uh, if it just don't work, you, you find you don't remember anybody. You cannot even remember, oh, who is this person? What's the uh, information of him or her? And uh, if uh, you always just follow this kind of uh, pushing, uh, then you might come into a narrower and narrower small circle because uh, he will uh, uh, push every time pushing the similar persons according to your taste. It may narrow our views, our life. This uh, certainly has the benefit side because it may uh, push to you the, the most beneficiary persons that you can meet and you can help with your uh, career, but uh, this technology can definitely have the negative. Side. But some argue 
uh, Jing Fang, that as artificial intelligence develops, it is not a, a tool that we have, but rather it could become part of us. So the story that you've been telling is certainly still separating human being with artificial intelligence. But actually, it could become one and complementing toward one another as the technologies develop. Yeah, actually, uh, in another episode, we also discussed that one. Uh, if you let the artificial intelligence to uh, represent, uh, no, to mimic your brain and uh, to have a digital personality, and then maybe by replicate another body, uh, you can have more replicants of yourself and also uh, the boundary between the human and the machine will perhaps blur yeah, yeah. and vanish. So all of these stories of course are science fiction type. Yeah. Uh, the reason why you do this is to raise people's attention about certain debates. Yeah. Does it work? Uh, we hope so, because we hope to invoke the uh, discussions, uh, the thinkings of ordinary people on technology, because we, are, we observe that technology has come so fast. Overwhelming. Yeah, overwhelming, all these new technologies. We hope to raise the attention and awareness of ordinary people, not by just uh, telling them, oh, you should read scientific papers. No, we hope to using the ma uh, materials of stories to let people to discuss. There's no right or wrong answer, but the more people are discussing, yeah, the more uh, sensible decisions they can make. There's a danger, some say. There's a deficit of information. As to those scientists who have been developing this system and the technicians who've been working on these systems, they know much better or much more than we do as laymen. But obviously, the social debate takes people like us to come into it and talk about what we think. And therefore, are we really have a real debate? Or actually it's a debate with huge deficit of information. Will that debate be healthy? Actually, I think that uh, for a lot of scientists and uh, technicians, sometimes they lack of the information of the real need of people because when uh, they try to develop the product, actually they are bridging the gap between uh, the, a technique and uh, the, the normal, ordinary people's life. So if they cannot uh, build a proper bridge, then the product might be uh, twisted and... Right, and people want to go around it because yeah. it doesn't need very useful. And maybe even harmful. So there should be that kind of communications between the scientific part and the normal people, and they understand each other, and they bo both sides should uh, uh, just uh, uh, narrow the uh, information deficit. Mm -hmm. Then a better product can be built uh, by, by the effort of both sides. So you do believe the integrity of the civil society based like this? Yeah, I believe in the value of communication. Communication of all parts of the society uh, to try to uh, give out its own point of view, its own information, and try to form a uh, better consensus. But of course, there's always the issue of efficiency vis-a-vis -vis the result, isn't it? So how do you, what do you make of it, particularly at a time when technologies are developing so fast? Yeah, so that's why we use the method of telling the stories. Uh, we, we hope also to raise the questions and discussions online, perhaps on Weibo, Zhihu, other platform. But we will also try to use the stories as, an, as a topic that can raise people's attention. Yeah, because stories have the power uh, yeah, to let people understand of the world. <laughs>
I, I think that there are merits in the uh, nowadays uh, educational system. However, the system lack of a lot of other things. For example, the promoting of uh, independent thinking capability and the promotion of creativity uh, and a larger insight of, of enlarging the horizon of one's cognition. All these are very important for the future because I think that uh, sometimes the students our young kids are just too far away from the real world because uh, they never think of uh, solve the real problems of the real world. Uh, but these are the most important uh, um, skills. Yeah, skills in the future because in the future uh, the society may be more complicated and the uh, uh, changing of time be more faster. So every day you have to uh, uh, deal with another problem, another project. You, you have to be very adaptive and uh, fast learning. The power of role model also very important. I know you've been working very closely with Da Liu, Liu Cixin, who of course uh, won this uh, international award for his book, uh, Three Bodies. Of course, you also a big winner in the science fiction world worldwide. So how will you know, the power of role models be able to inspire this kid on a learning process which is still relatively new here in China. I hope that um, uh, the winning of uh, uh, Da Liu and me um, should not be just regarded as a uh, um, literature prize and um, uh, it should not, not be taken only uh, technically or how to write something good and win a prize. That's nonsense. <laughs> <laughs> to me, it's nonsense. I, I think that I'm interested in science fiction because I'm passionate in uh, imagine about the future and uh, I'm passionate in exploring the uh, unknown space. When, whenever I, I think about, oh, there's something I know and I like to explore the, uh, the, the mysterious knowledge. I, I'm quite excited and I know that Da Liu is also that kind of person. He's a thinker within his own room and he has the crazy imagination <laughs> of the universe. Yes. Yeah, I hope that it is the uh, spirit of exploration that can be delivered to the others. Uh, because that's the uh, core spirit of science fiction right. and to let people to explore into the unknown field, explore into the future, into the space, into all the unknown world. And this is exciting. If the children, they learn the uh, exciting of uh, exploration, then I think they can do uh, good in a lot of fields, not only writings, but also they can do really good projects, they can do really good movies, they can do uh, programming. So I think it's the spirit that really matters. From your perspective, giving the children the best prospect is always the way to go. But at the same time, how would you equip them with the right degree of expectation and the fact that the tools could be helpful but the tools could also be messing up with what they could have as the best picture for their lives. Yeah, actually uh, the now the information is just too much and uh, we are all uh, burdened by the <gasps> well, well, uh, overwhelming information. So for internet really provide uh, unlimited information for everybody. However, there's still the cognitive gap uh, among people and some people can gain a lot and uh, um, make himself richer using the internet. Uh, and some people are just uh, left behind and they... The digital divide. Yeah, say. yeah. So that's the uh, digital capability perhaps we everybody should have in the future in order to catch up with the uh, world. And also um, there is still the people who uh, set the rules for this new world and the people who are just uh, consuming or uh, just uh, um, follow the rules. So the um, cognitive gap in internet world 
might even be uh, enlarged in the future. So I myself is uh, I'm also concerned of this problem because technology just goes too fast beyond normal people's realization. So I I myself hope to deliver more and more uh, very cheap or even free um, online courses to normal kids and to help them to catch up with these technology development or at least to provide some uh, channel for them to know what kind of jobs that, that I can do, right. what skills that is needed and what should I learn during the process and I hope to make it cheap and mm -hmm. sell so that it could be available to everybody. Yeah. A free source of information that are useful. Yeah, I hope so. I hope to just uh, select and develop really uh, helpful channels for the for normal kids. One step at a time, I guess. <laughs> yeah. Jingfang, what a pleasure seeing you once again. Thank you so much. Thank you, thank, thank you. Hao <laughs> Jingfang, science fiction writer and award-winning writer as well. And that is all the time we have for today. If you'd like to see more, try to find us World Inside CGTN into your search engine or check out our YouTube channel. Follow us on Twitter, Facebook, and Sina Weibo. From Etienne Wei and everyone on the World Inside team, thanks for watching and tune in again next time for more insights across China and around the world. Have a great weekend. <laughs>